the evening on behalf of the Haiti Action Committee. Uh, the sponsors, we would like to welcome you here. Tonight's subject begins with the February 29, 2004 overthrow of Haiti's democratically elected government, which brutally ended Haiti's 10-year experience with democracy. Orchestrated by U.S., France, and Canada, the coup forced the elected government of Nobel Trinity into exile and removed thousands of elected officials from office. The U.S. installed an occupation regime willing to enforce its agenda in the international community and the time in Haitian elite. Widespread systematic violence resulted against Haiti's majority poor population who support President Aristide. Thousands were murdered, forced to flee, or summarily jailed without cause under the occupation. These facts have been largely overlooked by the mainstream media. This is where the lens of study comes in. Released in 2006 of September, the study validates facts that other human rights investigations reported to lead the methodological study published by a highly recommended international medical journal is a powerful tool to ignore. The study exposed that Thousands of people were murdered in Haiti in Port-au-Prince, the capital city of Haiti, in the 22 month period after the victory. The study exposed previously unknown facts about the impact of the coup on Haitian women and children in the popular neighborhoods. 35,000 women and girls were sexually assaulted in Haiti's capital city during the 22 month period. That is why we are here tonight. According to the UN report on violence against women, <coughs> rape is the, is the least condemned of all crime, even though rape of thousands of women and children has happened throughout history during the war. Maybe because it is so common, rape has tra traditionally been accepted as, as incidental to war. But women in Haiti and around the world have struggled to, to expose rape during war and conflict as a systematic tool of repression. They have forced the issue onto the international human rights agenda. Since 1991, rape has been recognized as a human rights violation, as torture, and as a war crime. Tonight, our speakers will set the record straight about the terror the U.S. the U.S. unleashed against the Haitian population, especially women and children. About the ongoing U.N. and the U.S. occupation, and also the resilience of the struggle of the Haitian people for democracy. And to begin, we are going to have our first speaker, who is a Haitian born, and who is a, also a Haitian activist, and who is the co-founder of Haiti Action Committee. And I know most of you here know who he is, and he needs no further introduction. To Pierre Lebosier. <laughs> Corby and Royce Hudson 
I want to thank you so much for your support, for the great work that you have done, because many of us, the people of Haiti, have been saying that over the airwaves, the kind of terror that was being unleashed on the population. We have seen a lot of the reports, we have read a lot of the accounts. I want to call in particular uh, a big thank you, say a big thank you to the San Francisco Bayview newspaper, to Flashpoints, and also to uh, Democracy Now! for having been there and exposed the atrocities that have been going on in Haiti. And uh, so people in Haiti, but why is this thing being done to our brothers and, to our brothers and sisters in Haiti? Well, people in Haiti, just like all of us, they want justice. They want bread for themselves, for their children. They want schooling for their children. They want uh, health care so that when they get sick, they can go to a hospital, they can go to a clinic and get some medicine and get some health care. They want clean drinking water because the drinking water in Haiti is so bad, it's so inaccessible to the population that most people get sick because of this, of the drinking water. So they want clean drinking water. And for this, they chose, they built a movement, organized a movement, and they elected representatives, not just the president, but representatives from their communities and also the national office and the office of presidency to represent their interests. And this was the program that was being put in place to move the people, as President Aristide rightly says, from misery, the misery in Haiti, to at least step up to poverty with dignity. Now, that doesn't mean we are going to stop there, but at least to get to that level, because the conditions in Haiti are so miserable that people wanted to organize this movement. Uh, and I see a representative of KPU there. Thank you so much, brother, because KPOO in San Francisco has been really one of, the, one of the organs, one of the media outlets that tell the people of San Francisco the news about what's going on in Haiti. For this, as in many other lands, but tonight we are speaking about Haiti, the people have been at the receiving end of a terror by the Haitian elite, and their allies abroad, namely the, uh, the US, France, and Canada. Now, when I'm talking about the US, I'm not talking about you, you know, about us here. <laughs> I'm not talking about the Bay Area community either. I'm talking about this little tiny group of self-righteous, right-wing zealots who think that they can dominate the world and keep people including people here in the Bay Area, in a state of submission. Uh, so it's the same thing that's going on in Haiti, and that's why it's important for us to be in solidarity. But in Haiti, as we are seeing it today, the repression against our brothers and sisters is terrible, particularly when we are looking at women, the situation of women. What's happening is by no accident that women have been specifically targeted. Specifically, there has been systematic, systematic rape. That started as a phenomenon that started occurring system-wide, widespread since the coup of 1991. Before that, we had coup d'etats. Before that, we had the compromise coups, and they would arrest people, men, women, children. They would do horrible things to them, disappear them. But you didn't have this random systematic raping of women. It's some brand new that appeared on the political scene in Haiti in 92 following the 91 coup d'etat. And so this is something that was really horrible. Uh, many people were, after they were raped, they were, they were killed. Many were not killed, but they are living with tremendous scars. But what did the women do? They organized themselves. They organize into various organizations to talk about what has happened to them. Because generally in our society, in Haitian society, as in everywhere else, someone who's raped, someone who's um, men or women, but women mostly who are raped, you feel unclean. Society looks down on you. It's like somehow it's your fault. But these sisters, the movement in Haiti was strong enough that the women organized themselves and said, no, 
we are going to get out there. And here I'm thinking of the women's, uh, the women's organization, Favilet. These are a group of women, and it's spelled F-A-V-I-L-E-K. This is a group of women victim of gang rape by the FWAP death squad who had to reorganize themselves and went all over the country putting on plays in which they themselves acted what has gone on to them and they are acting out how they are fighting back and they are calling on other women who are in the audience to come out and join with them and fight for justice. So this was tremendous and it gave a great, it, it led into uh, some court cases. Chiefly among them was a massacre perpetrated by the death squad and the Haitian army in 93 or 94 in Raboto. Many of these women were part of that. Right now, recently, the Center for Justice and Accountability actually represented a group of these women right here in the US. And they were successful in their lawsuit bringing to justice the head of FRAC, the head of the paramilitary death squad, Toto Constant, brought him to justice and they won a judgment, I forgot how many millions of dollars, that is liable, he must pay to these women for what he has done. So this is, uh, when you are in Haiti, why are the women being targeted? It's not just because they are women, but they are organizers. They are the backbone, the strength of the movement in Haiti. The women are the backbone of the Haitian economy. And many of the women from the grassroots, these are the peasant women, the women in the, in the cities who were forced off the land and into the cities in conditions in places like Cité Soleil. We have neighborhoods such as Tokyo and Boston. Now, don't think it's the pretty Boston, okay? Or the pretty Tokyo. Now, these are places where with open sewers, with mud and what have you, um, bad conditions, where people can get a decent, a decent meal but the people have organized there. And these are the people who gave rise to the Lavalas movement. And this is why they are being targeted. So February 29th, the coup d'etat took place. The women were immediately targeted, many of the cooperatives, many people had to go into hiding. Haiti lost many of its key grassroots organizers. Many were killed, and uh, many were driven into exile. Haiti is a country that's tremendously organized. You'll see so many different women's organizations at the grassroots level. But what happens is, they are too poor. They don't have access to computers. They don't have access to electricity. So many people don't get to hear their side of the story. But you will see them on the streets of port au the streets of Lecai, of Cap Haïtien. You'll see them in the countryside, where they are organized, trying to set up a clinic here, a little school there for their kids, organize into Timachon, the vendors in, in the marketplace, organize, trying to share their resources to see if they can eke out a living from the miserable conditions. That's where you'll find it. And in the organizations, you don't see the organization sending out press releases and going to a uh, World Social Forum, uh, you know, at the drop of a bat, or attending <coughs> this meeting or that meeting simply because they can afford it. And nobody sees them, they are invisible. However, that is to many from the mainstream media. However, I want to thank people from the Haiti Action Committee, all the organizations that are here, people who go to Haiti and work with people at the grassroots level. They know the truth because they talk to the people there. The big media doesn't see them. They see these are the, well, these are the women's organizations who speak for the people of Haiti. I'm sorry. When the grassroots women take to the streets in Haiti, they are there by the thousands. When the others who claim to speak for them do a rally, it's, um, eh, it's successful if it has about 80 people. So, you know, um, that's the difference. So we have apartheid in Haiti based on class that is reflected in the way the movement is perceived outside of Haiti. But let me stop right there. Can I just say just a couple words about our speakers and then let them take it from there? Athena Colby, a social work research, researcher, came to Wayne University in 2004 after working for nearly a dozen years 
in, as a journalist for an international news wire agency. With experience living and working in more than 25 countries, Kobe coordinated a study in which 1,260 randomly selected households were surveyed about their experience with women rights abuses. In addition to holding a master's degree in social work from Wayne State University, Kobe holds a master's degree in theology. She is going to be talking to you about her research here this evening. Our second speaker tonight is going to be Dr. Royce Hudson of the Wayne State University School of Social Work. Professor Hudson uh, came to Wayne State also in 2004 after having been a uh, research fellow at the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He had also served several years as a commissioner on the Community Development Block Grant Commission in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Professor Colby's research expertise is in human rights epidemiology and community development. And do pay attention to the, um, some of the methods they use to, to get the information they're going to share with you because you'll see how they use traditional survey research methods with some very innovative new techniques that I think is going to open a floodgates of uh, researchers' ability to find out what's really happening, what the real patterns and extent of human rights abuses are, not only in Haiti, but in many other parts of the world where there's a lot of high density uh, poor populations. So here we go. Here's to our speakers. So it made it very difficult to use traditional survey methodology. 
So typically what we do is we get a list of addresses, for instance, and then we randomly select a few and, and go ahead and interview them. And we couldn't do that. And we couldn't do uh, what's typically when you do a uh, representative sample, representative sample being where you're trying to get generalized to the broader population. Um, oftentimes we do it in what we call a cluster sampling way, which is we sensibly oversample sections that have denser populations and undersample those with less dense populations. Um, and we couldn't uh, do that in this particular study. So what we used um, is this method called random GPS coordinate sampling. Now this type of sampling technique had been used previously in a different form with Les Roberts and his colleagues at uh, Johns Hopkins University for the Iraq study on mortality before, or at, before and after the invasion by U.S. forces. And so, however, in those, in those particular studies, they did have population density maps. And so they could use this cluster sampling thing, but we didn't have that luxury. So what we did was we established boundaries of the greater Port-au-Prince area geographically. Um, and then what we did was we, lit, we generated a list of random GPS coordinate points within those set boundaries. And then we, we did that for about 1,500 points. And then we threw out the points that were uninhabited. So if it was on an airport runway or in the middle of the sea or a beach or something, we threw those points out. And we ended up with roughly about uh, 1,350 or so inhabited points. Um, yeah, so 1,389 valid locations. Uh, 51 refused to participate, and 77 had no adult household members when we went there. We went there up to four times looking for an adult household member. And then we went, removed one from the data set. And the one we removed from the data set, because we actually provided medical assistance to this poor woman, she had been raped with a piece of rebar, and we had to immediately evacuate her to a hospital where she subsequently died. Um, so we had 1,260 households that were surveyed with, a pr uh, with I would say, is a very excellent response rate of 90.7%. What that really says to us, because given the sensitive nature of the questions we were asking, imagine asking someone if they had been raped before, it's a very sensitive topic. To have people you know, respond 90% of the time on such, a, such questioning, I think, really suggests that they were wanted to speak about their experiences with human rights. Um, and what we found was is that both crime and human rights violations were common in Port-au-Prince during the study period. So we examined from the overthrow of Aristide up until the time of the study, which was December of 2004, right? 2005, 2005 sorry. Um, and what we found was is that criminals, political <coughs> actors, and unknown assailants were the ones that generally committed the crime. And how we separated criminals from the rest of what we call quote unquote political actors was that we defined those groups so when the, when the, when the, when the victim said, well, this you know, was a uh, Haitian National Policeman that did this to me. And then we, of course we'd ask them, well, how do you know it was a Haitian National Police member? Well, they were wearing a uniform. And then they would go on and talk about that. Um, those we considered political actors. When they said, well, we didn't know, or it was a you know, random criminal, that's what we decided as criminals. And if they didn't know at all, then they were unknown. And sometimes they wouldn't disclose who did that to them for fear of repercussions. So in general, before we get to these, the topic of sexual assault, I think it's important to put sort of what's happening in Haiti in context, why these, all these mass rapes are occurring. What we found with regards to uh, homicide is that of all the households we surveyed, 23 said that someone had been murdered. Um, and the most common was through uh, gunfire. Um, also through beatings, torture, knife wounds, and asphyxiation. And there was a, uh, several others that we did this way. Um, so using a technique that is frequently used in epidemiology, we came to a rate of 219 per 100,000 per year number of murders. Well, that number of murder rate uh, is astronomical. If you look at Detroit, Michigan, my hometown where I live, oftentimes people have this vision of how dangerous Detroit may or may not be. It has about a six times the murder rate in Port-au-Prince than there is in Detroit, Michigan. Wow. Mayor, one of, arguably one of America's most dangerous cities. So we estimated, given this 219 per 100,000 per year, that 8,000 people were murdered during the 22 months of the study. About 12 a day. 
With regards to physical assaults, uh, we found that 1% of all the individuals we surveyed had been assaulted. Uh, there's the crude rate there, 563 per 100,000 per year. And so about 21,000 people were physically assaulted. And I want to say that these physical assaults were life-threatening physical assaults. So uh, we also, as Athena mentioned earlier, looked at detentions, kidnappings, and arrests. You can see here the crude rate was 343 per 100,000. So we estimated about 13,000 people were arrested by either the HMP or the UN or multinational forces. I think the important thing, oh, we can't go back, can we? Um, the important thing about noting about the arrest figures is that 25% of those who were arrested were still in prison at the time of the study. Um, and we found that 22% of the arrests were of preventative detention. And in preventative detention, what we mean is oftentimes it's juveniles who are arrested without having committed a crime and the purpose to prevent crime, essentially. Um, and of all the arrests that we detected, only one had seen a judge in the 48 hours as stipulated by the Haitian Constitution. With regards to political affiliations, because what we did is we looked at if whether particular people were targeted for uh, human rights violations. And one of the things that I don't think people understand really is, you know, given the sort of the cacophony with the cacophony, if you will, in uh, the media about who supports whom, you can see here what the political landscape in Haiti is. Over, well over half is either a Lavalas or Les Claw party, a support. Now you see here 27.1% says no political affiliation. We believe personally that probably as a result of fear of repercussion or not trusting the interviewers. Um, you can see there is 7.9% or another party, which is a slew of, and then missing or refused was 4%. And so if you look at who gets murdered by party affiliation, you notice that if you are not part of a particular party, you are 10 times less likely to be murdered. So people that were getting murdered in Haiti were party members of some particular party. And a large proportion of them, as you can see here, 87% were either Levelos or Les Plow party members. So of all the people that were murdered, 87% were members of those two political parties. Again, with the rest, you see that um, Lavalas and Les Plow were three and a half times more likely to be arrested than anyone else in a political party or those who were not part of any political party. And they made up roughly about 86% of all the people that were arrested during the time for period exam. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, sexual assault, because that was one of the serious issues that we looked at as well. Um, but before I talk about that, I want to talk a little bit about um, what we mean when we say sexual assault and what we're talking about when people say mass rape, and they throw around this term mass rape a lot when they're talking about the situation in Haiti. So um, I think it's important that people who oppose mass rape, which I hope everybody here opposes rape, that um, we understand a little bit about some of the background and the literature and the research that's been done on that. So mass rape is basically rape during any armed conflict can be considered collective or mass rape, which are the two, chains are, two terms are interchangeable, if it's used as a weapon of war. Um, it need not be directly ordered by paramilitary, military, or government leader to be considered um, collective or mass rape. Um, rather, mass rapes are patterns of abuse directed at the population as a form of or in concert with a campaign of systematic or widespread repression. Mass rape is often viewed as a byproduct of poor military um, discipline or as um, a result of a society that's um, briefly out of control. There's a war going on and, and these people involved in it or people who aren't involved are going around and raping people. But um, recent research, uh, particularly research on the situation in Bosnia and Rwanda, um, indicate that in fact mass rape is, is often politically motivated and it's used as a method of suppressing political dissent during times of um, political dissent during times of um, unrest and armed conflict. Um, and at times, obviously, mass rape has been systematically organized by governments. Historically, mass rape um, has been viewed as an attack on men's armor. Um, we're going in, we're taking their land, and we're raping their women, something like that. Not as a criminal assault or a criminal attack on the woman who is assaulted. Um, 
currently, there is a, a number of cases going through the International Criminal Court, um, which define rape and prosecute rape, mass rape as a crime against humanity as is defined by the Nuremberg Tribunal. And this is a very significant leap forward in terms of um, looking at legal precedents and international law as it, as it applies to mass rape. Um, the Istanbul Protocol for Documenting Torture was one of the documents that we used for um, shaping our survey instrument, the, the survey that we used to interview people. Um, the Istanbul Protocol has a whole section on um, defining mass rape and defining um, acts that occur within sexual assaults as they relate to sexual um, torture and also um, mass rape and rape during times of war. Um, they point out um, that sexual assault begins with forced nudity. And um, I put in a quote from them here. It says, one is never as vulnerable as when naked and helpless. Nudity enhances the psychosocial terror of every aspect of torture, as there is always the background of potential abuse, rape, or sodomy. Mass rape and sexual torture, as it applies to mass rape, can include being assaulted, like sexually assaulted, being forced to watch the assault of a loved one or a stranger, or being forced to have sexual contact with another unwilling participant. And all of these things, three things were things that we recorded in our study. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the literature that's been conducted on mass rape. Um, obviously, we know there's been a lot of research on what are the results of, of sexual abuse and of rape to women in general. Um, and to girls also. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the, um, the literature as it relates specifically to mass rape. Um, some of the medical consequences are sexually transmitted diseases, unwanted pregnancy, bleeding, bruising, infections, incontinence, hemorrhaging, and infertility. Um, politically motivated assault <coughs> also has a significant psychological component. Um, and Sexual torture and mass rape has been associated with increased risk of anxiety, cognitive problems, loss of memory, mood disorders, sleep disorders, sexual dysfunction, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, personality disorders, and behavioral problems in the victims. Um, chronic post-traumatic headaches are very common among survivors of mass rape. Um, children are particularly at risk and particularly vulnerable to having um, not just medical problems as a result of mass rape, but also psychological and behavioral problems. Um, children can be injured um, when they witness violence, when they um, are attacked themselves, or just simply by being a child in a family that has experienced mass rape. Um, displaced children, that is children who are um, internal refugees, um, they're from Port-au-Prince and they have to flee to the countryside, or they're from the countryside and have to flee to Port-au-Prince, or they're externally, externally displaced, meaning they're from Haiti and they have to flee to the Dominican Republic or to another country. They're, um, they may have more significant and serious problems. Um, being a victim of uh, mass rape, and also I want, I want to clarify also, when I say victim, I know that there's um, a real movement within the women's movement to not refer refer to women who've been sexually assaulted as victims. Um, in Creole, the word is victim, and it has a different social connotation, and so since most of my work on this has been speaking to people who speak Creole, not English, um, I use the word victim, and I, I, don't, I hope I don't offend anybody, and, and that you don't take it that I'm referring to women as being victims, not as survivors. Um, there's, um, oh, um, there's an increased um, risk if you experience this um, mass rape for social problems, developmental regression. That would be like a child who's eight or nine years old and suddenly forgets to be toilet trained um, or regresses into like talking to baby talk. Um, substance use and abuse, poor school performance, depression, um, phobias, and the two phobias that are most common with children who are subjected to mass rape are an irrational fear of going to the toilet and an irrational fear of the dark. Um, separation anxiety, bedwetting, temper tantrums, and night terrors, which are basically like um, having nightmares. Um, adolescent victims may undergo a profound personality transformation. This includes increased risk taking, taking and antisocial behavior. Um, children may have physical problems like scarring to prevent regular development. 
And parents and families often have very profound problems when a child is, is subjected to mass rape, including parents becoming overly protective, um, refusing to talk with the child or with others about the event, or refusing to get their child medical or psychological help, um, being so hurt by their own experiences of being subjected to these violations that they can't cope with their children's um, feelings or, or the problems that their child is experiencing, and the continued violence within the family, there's uh, increased risk of having intra-family violence after experiencing mass rape. The continued violence within the family or within society in general can prevent the family from ever healing and moving on. Um, of the 5,760 individuals in our study, we found that 3.1% of all females were um, subjected to sexual assault during the 22 months that we studied. Um, our, the victims, um, in our study ranged in age from 5 to 84. The majority of the assaults included penetration. So this, um, we asked people exactly what did they do to you and the Istanbul Protocol and Paradox, which is another document that has a standardized <coughs> vocabulary for reporting um, um, human rights violations, has an actual list of you know, what exactly happened during the sexual assault. And so we recorded things using their vocabulary and um, Based on that, we know that more than 90% um, of the assaults were serious. Many of these sexual assaults included multiple perpetrators, um, and sometimes people were mul raped multiple times, or maybe multiple victims within one household were sexually assaulted. Um, the crude sexual assault rate is uh, 1,698 for 100,000 um, females per year, and we're estimating that 35,000 women and girls were assaulted during the study period. Um, children were particularly at risk for sexual assault. As you can see, 4.6% um, of all the girls in the sample were sexually assaulted, and we're estimating that 19,000 girls were sexually assaulted during the study period. What's the age? Um, the, the youngest girl was five years old at the time of the attack, six years old when we did the study, but she was five when she was sexually assaulted. Um, and the oldest child was eight, so it was, you know, 17. <coughs> yeah, that's how, that's how we defined it, it was five to 17. Um, rest of us who are girls who work as unpaid domestic servants, they're usually from the countryside, um, and they get sent to the city to live with other families, not necessarily wealthy families, but just other families, and they work in exchange for room and board. Um, they had a higher sexual percent of the sexual assault victims in our study were rest of X. Um, the crude rate for um, rest of X was 5,209 per 100,000 rest of X per, per year. We estimated that there were several hundred thousand rest of X in Port of Prince alone. Um, compared to other girls, um, <coughs> rest of X were 4.5 times more likely to be sexually assaulted. The most common perpetrators for sexual assault were criminals. And um, this is probably understandable to those of us who were in Haiti right after the overthrow of Aristide because one of the first things that the, um, the forces involved in his ouster did is that they broke um, all the people out of the national penitentiary and thousands of criminals were let loose, um, which increased crime and insecurity throughout Port-au-Prince. It was a pretty scary time to be there. Um, and so, um, you know, more than half of, of the perpetrators that were named in the sexual assaults were, in fact, criminals. Uh, police officers were named in nearly 14% of the sexual assaults as well. Um, another group that was named as responsible for some of the sexual assaults were um, anti-law lost paramilitaries. These included ex-soldiers from the demobilized Haitian army. The Haitian army was um, decommissioned and demobilized in 1995 after they were um, accused of committing numerous human rights uh, violations during their first coup against Aristide. Um, it also included private militias, which are like a private army that's hired by a wealthy family to protect their interests, both their property and their business, and, and protect their interests um, as well. And then the rebel front, which were the people that came over, the Haitians that trained in the Dominican Republic and then came back over and did the coup against the elected government in 2004, and these included as um, they included and were led by ex-soldiers from the um, demobilized army, 
and then also armed anti Lagos groups such as Olave Timashat, which is the Little Machete Army, which is sort of an armed paramilitary group that's based in Port au Prince. These groups accounted for nearly 14% of sexual assaults during our study period. Um, so looking at, at the, the household party affiliation of, of the um, people who were victimized, and, and when we asked household party affiliation, we asked the respondent, the person we interviewed. So since most of the victims were children, they themselves were, were not affiliated with the party, obviously, because children, you know, a five-year-old isn't necessarily political. Um, but this is the political party affiliation of the adult in their household that we interviewed. Um, Nearly three quarters were uh, from households affiliated with Lava Lava or Las Quas, but this isn't statistically significant because the vast majority of patient families are either Lava Las Las Quas or unaffiliated. So um, we did find that they were a large number of victims, but um, it isn't significant statistically. Um, some of the limitations of our study is that we only interviewed people in Port-au-Prince, and we know that there were a lot of human rights violations including mass rape, which occurred in the countryside, and that people who lived in Port-au-Prince and then fled to the countryside wouldn't have been included in our study, and people who um, experienced violations in the countryside and never moved to Port-au-Prince wouldn't be included in our study either. Um, respondents reported um, only on violations to other household members and themselves, but they might not have been aware. For instance, if we interviewed a male household member, he might not have been told um, by the female household members that she had experienced sexual assault. Um, we, we didn't get any outside verification of the claims. Things were so chaotic in Haiti, it would have been very time consuming and in fact it's impossible in most cases to find you know, medical documentation or death certificates or anything like that for the claims of um, violations. Um, respondents may have blamed human rights violations on their political opponents. Most, many people may not have reported being a victim because they were facing repercussions. And um, the research indicates that many sexual assault victims are reluctant to disclose being sexually assaulted because of violence or uh, fear of violence, fear of shame, fear of um, you know, societal and cultural expectations, um, being afraid they're not going to be able to get married if they tell somebody that they were raped. Um, so they might not have even told us that it happened. Um, our conclusions were that obviously the human rights violations and crime were very common in Haiti during the time that we started. Um, the claims of systematic rights abuses against various political groups are only partially supported by our study. Um, we think that one of the biggest things Haiti needs right now is a responsive um, judicial system. The people who committed human rights crimes need to be held responsible legally. They need to um, be arrested and be prosecuted, and the victims need to have a forum in court to go and tell their stories about what happened and to feel like um, that the people who did this to them can be held accountable. Um, the police officers who committed crimes should be removed and prosecuted. There shouldn't be this impunity for, people, for police officers who are involved in human rights violations, even if the human rights violations took place while they were on duty. Um, there, there's a serious need in Haiti to develop services to meet the medical, psychological, and economic needs of survivors. And one of the big things that I think Haiti needs is there's been a push internationally for, from the international community is um, really pushing um, Preval, the new administration, and, and Haiti in general to move on and sort of to have this class reconciliation and to forgive the other side and to sort of just move on. Um, and, and while we, we definitely agree for the need for, for reconciliation, we also believe that um, there needs to be truth with reconciliation, that those who um, committed human rights violations, um, there's, the stories need to be told, um, they need to be called out, they need to be forced to accept responsibility for what they did, um, and there needs to be a climate where um, the truth about what took place isn't buried in the name of reconciliation, but rather that the truth can actually be exposed about what took place during the um, time of the interim government. So Royce and I are up here, we'll, we'll take questions. Oh, I think we have another announcement before we take questions. Thank you. Those of us who've been to Haiti, many, many of you in the audience have been there, you know that a few dollars can go a long way. And because of so much of the ongoing turmoil, um, it's really difficult for people to eat have a living. 
another thing that's really important about getting the word out and showing support to the women, and you may get it and hear some of this in the Q&A period. Um, I was speaking with Athena the other day, and, and Royce also confirmed this. They were in Haiti last summer, right before the study was released and offered to speak to lots of different groups in Haiti. And the, none of the UN personnel, none, wanted to talk to them about this. Now here, this is a study that's coming out of one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, peer review, and it's talking about a subject that supposedly the UN is very interested in, right? That none of them would talk to them about it. So it's pretty significant um, that we show support where we can. And you're going to hear also at the end of the QA um, some more opportunities for action. In fact, I think this is being handed out uh, some action alerts about people that you can contact both here and in Haiti to let them know um, we're watching, we're aware of this, we, we need to have this change, we need to have an end of the impunity. And, uh, the Haitian people need to have an opportunity to take care of themselves. Uh, how do you negotiate being white American academics representing the Haitian women? Um, well, actually, I don't think that I represent Haitian women. I think that our research actually lets Haitian women represent themselves. Um, because what we did is we went to talk to them, and gave them a chance to tell the stories about what happened. Um, one of the challenging things was being there and being white. Um, I speak Creole, but not um, that doesn't you know make me Haitian. And um, the majority, of, well, actually, all of our research team except for me was Haitian. So, and about half more women. So um, that made doing the research a little bit easier because people felt more comfortable, obviously, talking to somebody who's Haitian. And I think that women probably. And I'm speaking just from some of my own experience at the moment, but so women probably felt more comfortable telling their story than other women. Um, but I think that part of the challenge is that um, there needs to be more of a forum for women who've experienced this to speak out. It needs to be not just us, but it means there needs to be more people hearing their voices and more opportunities for them to talk about what happened to them. Um, so that it's not just us and the Lancet saying, you know, this happened, but also that the women who experienced it have a place to say that too. And they're really in the, that kind of foreign international right now. Within Haiti, radio is really the medium that has been on the pulse of the population. And, and on the radio, you'll sometimes hear women um, be interviewed or talk about being experiencing mass rape. But you don't really hear that when you're talking about Haiti outside of Haiti. Uh, I was curious if uh, the, uh, the new graphs you have showing the percentage of uh, people who are killed from different political parties and assaulted, are you going to publish that? Because I think that wasn't, that wasn't in your original um, study. Yeah, we're presenting that actually. Part of our thing here is that we're presenting it to the Society for Social Work and Research on Saturday on just this topic, which is who was the victims. We focused, we focused on the perpetrators in the Lancet study because we felt that that was the most important thing. We, can't, we couldn't really put everything in the study. This time, we're talking about the victims and we will be publishing on the victims. Yes. Given the failure of truth commission processes in Haiti in the past and your recommendation of having a truth-telling process, what sort of concrete steps do you see as, you know, would you do another truth commission and try and resurrect that process? What other steps would you take towards truth and reconciliation? Oh, that's kind of a big question. Um, I would say that the first step is that the people who are victimized have to have to be able to speak. They have to feel free to speak and that they have to feel like their security is guaranteed. They have to feel like they're not going to have reprisals against them for coming out and publicly and saying what happened to them. Um, I would say that the second thing that happens is that um, the community organizations that are already working on this issue need to be the ones who are guiding the process and uh, bring the truth out about what happened. That it needs to be something not from the UN imposed on the Haitian people, but from the Haitian grassroots. And that the women's organizations, which are already organized, which are already talking about this, which are already connected with um, women who've experienced this, which are often led by women who've experienced mass rape, are the ones that need to be guiding the process. And that, um, obviously, there's a lot that was said about um, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa and how that, was, how that worked and how it didn't. 
And, um, but we know that what happened in South Africa was not what happened in Haiti the last time that there was a, a truth commission. Um, that the experience was very different. And um, I think that there's still things that we can learn from an experience, um, have an experience that was closer to what took place in South Africa, where in fact um, people who perpetrated human rights violations did have a period of time where they could come clean about what they did. And I think that's actually, you know, in talking to people, what I've heard is they, it's not that they want people to suffer because they made them suffer. It's that they just want them to acknowledge it. They just want them to come out and say, yes, I did this, or yes, I ordered this, or yes, I was part of this, or yes, I witnessed this as other police officers did it and I didn't do anything. I think they just want the truth to come out. They just want it to be open. They want it to be out there. They want to not feel like they're crazy because they're the only ones who are saying that this happened to them and everyone in power is saying this never took place. Next. Can, you, can you talk some about the responses you've gotten to this research and uh, you getting criticized for being politically biased? Um, yeah, what in particular? Uh, nothing in particular. Okay. I'm just curious. What... Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely people who didn't want us to publish this and didn't want it, want, it, want this research to come out. And we received a lot of criticism from them um, in the first couple of days. Um, and I don't know. Um, I think, I mean, there's, I mean, if you look at who was doing the criticizing, I think I was a little disappointed. Well, I don't know if I was disappointed. Well, I was disappointed for me. But for the most part, I wasn't shocked by the way the media played sort of this quote unquote controversy with regards to our study. Um, I think, you know, it was it was to be expected, I think, for both of us, you know, the people that were doing it were ended up, you know, I think a lot of things happened with regards to this study, and I'm not necessarily surprised that we were personally attacked. I think it was the level of the attack that I think would really disturb me, and it took a lot of the media started focusing on Athena and myself and missed the big picture, which was this is about Haiti, this is about raped women and deaths and you know, this general chaos and lawlessness in Haiti, not about, you know, Royce Hudson or Athena Colby. And that's what really was disappointing to us with regards to this. With that said, I think the, the study has gotten some waves and now and people are talking about it. And we're very thankful that we can come to places like this and speak about it because we feel very... Um, last time Rio and Jeanette were in town, they talked about how the little machete armies would publicly massacre, massacre people in, in sports stadiums. Um, can you talk more about what the women's movement in Haiti is doing in response and resistance to these mass rapes and how the international feminist community can respond and support? Um, the incident that you're referring to took place in August of 2005, right? And it was, there were two massacres that took place, one at a soccer match, the soccer mass, match for peace, which was sponsored by the United Nations. And um, in that, a group of people from the Little Machete Army um, who were seen previously a couple hours earlier at a police station and receiving weapons, machetes, obviously, from a police officer or something, um, then went in and in full view, like there were like cameras running, it was like on TV or on the radio or something, and the UN officials were there, went in and assassinated um, some people. Um, and kind of like terrorized this crowd of people that were there watching the soccer match. Um, the Little Machete Army is still active. They're still patrolling the streets in some areas. They're, um, they have not been arrested or, or tried um, for the things that they've been involved in, although there has been a lot of publicity about what happened. There's been a lot of people speaking out. Um, in terms of the um, women's organizations, the ones that are connected, that have the resources to be connected with the international women's movement tend to be ones that are not exactly representative, not necessarily representative of the grassroots. They tend to be more middle class women's groups that have some more resources and thus might not necessarily reflect the experiences of women who experience mass rape. Um, I think one of the most important things that those of us in outside of Haiti who care about what's going on there can do is to find out about it, to read um, resources and connect with people who have been to Haiti and are traveling to Haiti, people like Pierre, um, 
who know about what's going on and to find out and to, um, to create a dialogue. I mean, I think there's definitely a place for a dialogue to, to happen. Um, and that there's a lot that I think that the international women's community um, can learn from the Haitian women who are working on the grassroots and, and trying to combat this like with very little resources in terms of creating a culture where um, mass rape is unacceptable and where it should be opposed. So, um, why, why do some kind of mainstream NGOs, international um, um, NGOs working in Haiti on some issues and not working on this problem of, of rape? I mean, I think there's a lot of issues here and people that have connections with some of these organizations or that feel like they have the chutzpah and want to go and talk to the UN. I think that they, there's definitely a role and a place for people to go and say to the UN, why aren't you doing anything about this problem in Haiti? Because I think maybe that's something that we, as, as people who you know, have access to email and can call the UN and talk to them, can do. Whereas you know, women in Haiti who maybe don't have access to email or phones can't do. Um, 